Good morning, everyone, and a very good welcome to all of us. Welcome to the speakers and welcome to the audience, both those participating through Zoom and those joining via live stream. This is a Chatham House Africa program public event on a South-South approach to cooperation on technology governance and the knowledge economy. Today's event concludes a series of discussions supported by the Omidia Network, exploring South-South approaches to cooperation on technology governance with a focus on Kenya, India, Nigeria, and South Africa. Before we start, I would like to um, highlight how the event will be run this morning. I would like to inform everyone that all attendees will be muted during the presentations, but you'll be able to use the raise hand function during the Q&A session in order to ask a question live. And I would encourage that we use the function, the, um, the raise your hand function to be able to ask questions live. If you are selected, you will then be granted by the Africa program team the ability to unmute yourself and ask a question. Of course, you may also submit written questions through the Q&A box throughout the meeting. But I will reiterate again that if you can, please use the raise your hand function during the allotted Q&A session so that you can ask a um, question directly. And this would enhance um, the interactive nature of the conversation this morning. Unfortunately, and I apologize for this, we're unable to take questions from participants who are joining us through Facebook Live at this time. Of course, these conversations can continue even after the event today. I would also remind us all that the meeting will be on the record. And this means that those present may use information from this meeting and may identify the speakers and any other participants um, in that regard. It is also great to tweet. Um, feel free to tweet the event using the hashtag CHAfrica. But then to also remind us that filming and recording of this event are not allowed without prior permission from Chatham House. Um, before we go on then, I would like to introduce the speakers, but of course, introduce the discussion this morning. The rise of domestic digital platforms, proliferation of innovation hubs, and research and development centers across the global south bring some promise for potentially balancing traditional uneven patterns of global knowledge production. Building innovation driven and knowledge based economies is an important component of many national development plans and international cooperation efforts. However, the standard emphasis on capacity building and skills transfers often clouds other priorities, especially for the global south, including on how to develop and maximize truly homegrown knowledge ecosystems and technology production amidst the dominance of multinational technology companies and how to inclusively invest in domestic innovation capacities. So this morning, we are joined by eminent experts in diverse fields of digitization and innovation to explore the intersection of technology and the global knowledge economy. They would analyze the policy and legislative dimensions of innovation, research and technology development, as well as the shared challenges and potential collaboration strategies among actors in the global South. I will introduce our four speakers this morning. Um, and of course, a short bio in relation to them, but to let you also know that detailed bio um, is still available in the link to the program. We are joined by Nekesa Were. Nekesa Were is the Director of Strategy with Africa Labs, which works to ensure a thriving innovation economy across the 202 innovation hubs in 46 African countries that make up the Afri Labs network. For the last decade, Nekesa has worked at the heart of Africa's technology innovation ecosystems, and most recently as Managing Director of the iHub, Kenya's leading innovation hub. We are also joined by Professor Chidi Ogwamanam, who is a professor in the Faculty of Law with the University of Ottawa, affiliated with the Center for Law, Technology and Society, the Center for Environmental Law and Global Sustainability, and the Center for Health Law, Policy and Ethics. 
Through the Centers of Excellence, Professor Ogwamanam's research explores global knowledge governance in cross-disciplinary paradigms with interest in intellectual properties interface with indigenous knowledge systems in agriculture, health, biodiversity, the environment, and new technologies. He also holds senior research fellowships and associate positions with various organizations. We also have Kobotso Dishego Magoro, who is a PhD student in interdisciplinary digital knowledge economy studies in the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. Her doctoral research focuses on cultural knowledge systems, practices and processes of rural, rural communities as the foundation for culturally embedded digital transformations. She is also currently employed as the director responsible for learning and innovation in the Department of National Treasury in South Africa. We also have Gunjan Chawla. Gunjan is the program manager of the technology and national security team at the Center for Communication Governance. Her research focuses on issues that arise at the intersection of technology and national security law, including surveillance, cybersecurity, information warfare, and the interplay of international legal norms with domestic regulation. Prior to joining the Center for Communication Governance, Gunjan worked at the International Court of Justice in The Hague, Netherlands as a judicial fellow. I welcome you all this morning, and it would be an absolute pleasure to hear your perspectives on very important discussions related to the topic of a South-South cooperation to um, South-South Corporation on Technology Governance and the Knowledge Economy. If I could start off, I would want to start off with Nekesa. Nekesa, it's a pleasure to have you this morning. And thank yes, thank you. And I would want you to touch upon interrogating priorities for the global south. Um, you know, one of the debates you find highlighted in research discussions is that one of the most significant challenges facing countries today is the dominance of Northern epistemologies on the role of technology in politics and even in public life. It would be a delight to have you share your perspective on the global south and why it is important to re-interrogate priorities and the priorities for developing grassroots innovation capacities. Thank you. Thank you, Nena. Um, so what I loved about this, this panel and the, the invitation that I got was that this speaks exactly to, to the work that AfriLabs does. Uh, we hear over and over again about um, Africans building solutions to their challenges or working with people and communities closest to the problem, which remain relevant and always remain relevant uh, but at Apilabs, we're working to try and expand um, this into documentation, shared experience, peer-to-peer -peer learning, and so on. So <clears throat> as I think about what the priorities might be, and in the context of, of Apilabs and the work that we do, so for sure, a lot of the work that we do is around improving the infrastructure for our hubs in collaboration with some of the partners that we have. Um, so think about your last mile connectivity, think about funding, think about ensuring that these hubs across the continent so that innovators, regardless where they sit geographically, are able to access the kind of support that they need. Um, but what I want to focus on today is, is actually the community, which I feel would be the foundation, because if you don't have community as a foundation um, on which we build this uh, innovation capacities, then we, we are at fault. <laughs> we are at fault um, right from the beginning. And so I, I would want to rephrase the question slightly. Um, to how would we build grassroots um, communities? And for me, there's five key ingredients, uh, none of which would, would work in isolation. Uh, and, and looking again at Apri Labs as, as an example, when we began 20, 2012, uh, we just done 10. 
um, last year. And when we began to just five hubs, and at the time, what we're looking to do was really build relationships and, and get to trust each other and understand where each was coming from and, and what their pain points were and what we could do to increase the number of hubs across Africa. Um, and to date, we now have about 320 hubs, 51 African countries covered. And so I like to believe that we, 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 we have a good thing going. And so for me, the first key ingredient would be building, building relationships. And so we do this at a Pan-African level as Afri Labs, but you see this also replicated at the national level um, with associations uh, in Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, um, I think some coming up in Uganda, Tanzania as well, and Cameroon. Um, and so in Kenya, you have the Association of Startup and SME Enablers of Kenya. Um, in Nigeria, you have the Innovation Support Network. In Ghana, you have the Ghana Hubs Network. And what this, these networks are doing is, is really trying to build relationships amongst the hubs at, at the national level, again, to ensure that there is trust that is built amongst them uh, as a first step, and then moving from there to begin to actually talk about innovation and what they what could they do collaboratively of course understanding that together they are um, more productive than the sum of the individual parts um in kenya and actually in other countries as well you find that that breaks down even further and so in kenya yes you have the association of startup and SME enablers but you also have a relationship being built by association of countrywide hubs and what this is is that it's focused specifically on hubs based outside of of the capital city nairobi um, understanding that perhaps the infrastructure and the opportunities available in the capital city may not necessarily be available to towns in other parts of the country and so so you can see it, it kind of proves that there are several layers to localization and contextualization even within national borders when it comes to how we increase our national capacities and there's, there's just a real need to develop relationships. Um, so relationships is one. Second for me is the shared vision. And at Afri Labs, we talk about a thriving innovation economy in Africa driven by the power of our community. And how we see this cascade uh, into our hubs and the entrepreneurs that they serve is that Whenever you hear them speak, they will usually be speaking about a vision where their entrepreneurs and their communities realize increased income. Um, and so by doing so, there's then a lot of, there's more equity, there's quality of life, um, and, and also they, be, they begin to ensure dignity of, of their community, of the people within their country. Uh, and, and so having a shared vision for me sticks out as perhaps a second ingredient to, to innovation capacities. And then third is, what values do you stand for? And you'd find this a lot, especially outside of the capital cities. Um, if you're walking in, into, say, a community and they, they're trying to get to know you, to be, what are you about? What, what gets you going? And so in our context as well, as well, it is, what do you stand for? Uh, why are you here? What values do you hold dear? Um, and drawing from my previous example of Association of Startup and SME Enablers in Kenya, one of the things that they launched last year was a code of conduct for the Kenyan um, innovation ecosystem, basically talking about uh, how to build trust, how to build partnerships, um, access to information, fair play, accountability, collective responsibility, all things that are key uh, to, towards an, ena an enabling community for, for innovation, but then really focusing on these are the values that you expected to uphold if you're interacting with the Kenyan innovation ecosystem, regardless whether you're a startup or an SME, a hub, um, government, a funder, et cetera. Um, so shared value is, is number three for me. And then four would be co-creation. And what I, what I find really interesting about this is, is the way that this seems to have been embraced, at least in, in our ecosystems, is that while tech remains a great tool for innovation, um, homegrown knowledge ecosystems sometimes will need a lot more than that. So a lot of new approaches. And ex an example that I love is Sandbox that's based in, in Kenya. So Sandbox is a community of SME experts. And what they have committed to is collaboratively um, developing solutions for, for SMEs, so long-term solutions. And they've done this with five core engines. They have a people engine uh, that has several experts. And so you have your HR expert, your leadership expert, your wellness expert, all these experts coming together to form what they call a people engine and supporting SMEs long-term on how to build up 
um, those capacities around their leadership, their HR, how to ensure that um, they're, they're, the people that they work with, their employees are well, um, uh, and so on. And then there's a reach engine, and this is really focused on public relations, on branding and marketing. And so again, you have these experts working with SMEs and startups to ensure that yes, you're at a foundation, you may have a tech product, but you also need to begin to think about your public relations, your branding, your marketing, and so on. Uh, there's an efficiency engine that supports processes, tech tools, logistics, compliance, and a capital engine focused on your debt collection, your fundraising, your accounting, your planning, your finance, uh, fi financial planning, your taxation, and so on. Um, and then there's a value engine that supports your strategy, your product development, your customer experience, and so on. So you can see, yes, it, it could be a startup, a tech startup, but, but the focus of this is on curating collaboratively with the SME or with a startup, uh, how all these other engines work to ensure that whatever solutions are being built, whatever innovations are being explored would actually be um, sustainable. Uh, which brings me to my final key ingredient, which for me would be um, sustainability. Um, and how we see this at the at Afri Labs is we do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning and we find this really important because it, it kind of ensures a safe space, a comfortable learning experience. Um, and, and so a lot of the learning that we do would be peer-to-peer -peer learning. We do this about quarterly. Uh, we also have an AfriPass product. And what AfriPass does is that it enables our entrepreneurs and our hub managers find a home, regardless where on the continent they decide to explore. So again, 320 hubs, 51 African countries, there's lots of market, markets for our entrepreneurs um, and hubs to explore. And so what AfriPass, AfriPass does that it ensures that once you have it, there is someone for you to meet. Um, they are able to put together some kind of schedule for you. They're able to tell you where to live, perhaps while you're in the city. Uh, they're able to give you uh, documentation or information on market access. What are people in that particular area building and so on. Um, and then obviously our we, we do have plans for a learning platform. We would want for all of this information to sit uh, in a portal that's available to our hubs and any other innovators across the continent um, and also offer certification from Strathmore University that's based in, in Kenya. And, and so these are the kind of tools that we've used to just ensure sustainability of a lot of the work that we do, um, ensuring that whatever we discuss is not just available for the time, but then also exists beyond that. And so we're trying to build uh, a system of legacy, uh, also using storytelling and apprenticeship in, 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 you know, as, as tools for, for what we do in that regard. And so um, I'd love to leave it there and, and hopefully get into the details of these points once the other speakers have had an opportunity to share as well. Thank you, Nana. Thank you, thank you, Nikesa. Thank you so much. And also for speaking to us about the efforts at Afri Labs. It's good to know that amazing things are also happening um, in the global south. And I agree with you that sustainability is very important in the global south um, discussions. And of course, looking at the community and adopting what I may call, you know, the people-centered approach to developing grassroots innovation capacities. And of course, talking about the importance of relationships and shared vision, and importantly, reminding us um, to ask the question of what values we stand for in the Global South. I'm sure we'll come back to you with questions from the audience and of course, even myself shortly. I would go over to Professor Chidio Guamanam and um, to give him the opportunity to also share his perspective. You find that increasingly there are conversations on how technology can be holistically deployed for development progress in the global south. And that includes debates that realities of domestic capabilities should be at the forefront of policy formulation processes. Um, Professor Guamanam, it would be good to have you speak to us on legislative priorities for harnessing innovation and cultivating indigenous knowledge systems, please. Thank you so much. And, and I want to thank um, the African program at Chatham House, and particularly um, Dr. Nena Ajufo. I'm so grateful, and to meet you is wonderful, and to the rest of the panel. Um, let me start by saying that um, I enjoyed uh, listening to Nekesa, and I wanted to, 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 to patch or latch on to her observations, and um, so important that uh, all these labs and the potential they have to build capacity for Africa 
and, and the global south, particularly in the context of indigenous knowledge. And indigenous knowledge is always missing in the conversations around innovation in the global south. And for some reason, this uh, really worries me a lot. A, a book we published recently in Johannesburg called uh, Leap 4.0, African Perspectives on the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Uh, chapter two of that book captured um, the, the issue of indigenous knowledge missing in the discussion of innovation in Africa and, 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 and in the global south and how we can tackle this problem because that connection is rarely made at policy circles and is so compelling. So let me speak a little bit to the global knowledge economy and its interface with indigenous knowledge and to what legislative or policy interventions can happen in this space. Um, now we have moved beyond the conceptual separation of indigenous knowledge systems from technology and innovation and progress to the reality that indigenous knowledge systems have practical relevance to innovation. Before we used to say indigenous knowledge systems is, an, is antithetical to innovation, progress and development. That is really, really it belongs to the garbage bin of history um, because the whole colonial narrative that indigenous knowledge is not uh, innovative is, is purely colonial. If anybody reads the history of civilizations, you will know how Africa and the global South was always a front runner in innovation. But this whole narrative that removed indigenous knowledge from the space of innovation is purely a colonial garbage. And, and I want to speak a little bit to the advent of the so-called knowledge economy and what it has done to indigenous knowledge. What we have seen is that there's rampant and intense uptake of insights from indigenous knowledge systems across other knowledge systems. We have talked about biodigital revolution, bioprospecting, biopiracy, taking knowledge that belongs to the people and taking them to the global space and wearing uh, white coats and suits and putting them into test tubes and reinforcing and taking them away from the people it belongs to. And now the global knowledge system also reinforces colonial international division of labor, whereof the global South is dismissed as the source of raw materials and they do not add value to innovation. And that is worrisome. The same global knowledge system has demonstrated the open-ended disciplinary reach of indigenous knowledge systems. And I can give you some elaborations from culture to cultural property, food and agriculture, nutrition, medicines and therapeutics, environmental management, biodiversity conservation, and various uses of genetic resources. And not to talk about the creative industrial complex, traditional knowledge expression. Some of you know about Nigeria's Nollywood that is based essentially on people's lived stories and lives. Now tourism and trade, the branding aspects of TK based products, all of these implicate and transcend intellectual property regimes in different ways. Now today, what you see is that digitally facilitated research and development and production processes replicate all forms of creative knowledge pioneered through indigenous knowledge systems, from traditional motifs for baskets, paintings, braids, dressmaking, fabrics, textiles, jewelry. And what we see is appropriation of indigenous knowledge using digital technologies. And of course, Think about adaptations of sounds and folklores. Some of you may know about uh, 1939, uh, uh, Solomon Linda and Mbube. From 1939 to 2019, Mbube has become Netflix, the lion's share movie. That transition through audiovisual technology from an African music innovator is a powerful signification of what technology can do to indigenous knowledge systems. And who benefits through this? Well, through all of these exploitations, we see tendencies and new opportunities on multiple fronts to contest the status quo and assumptions about indigenous knowledge systems. And it's so important that the only way we could do this and change the narrative is through South-South collaborative intervention to ensure that our factor endowments and common interests in indigenous knowledge systems 
is better harnessed in the knowledge economy through context and local sensitive yet globally conscious policies and legislative interventions. Now, let me speak to intellectual property. At intellectual property level, the global South can only change the intellectual property regime through our common voice in challenging presumed orthodoxy, for instance, of the patent system. When people take knowledge that belongs to the local people or indigenous peoples and put them in patents and lock them up for monopoly, we're now beginning to ask, disclose the source and the origin of the materials and the knowledge you have used to get a patent so that those who produce that knowledge can partake in that space. We need to have a common voice in resisting the convenient tendency to relegate really indigenous knowledge systems to the public domain. We're told that indigenous knowledge belonged to the public domain. How did it get to the public domain? Was it by consent? And when you take the narrative of the public domain, then you, you, you forget that indigenous knowledge system is a dynamic knowledge system. It continues to be invented. So where is the novelty? You deny the novelty of indigenous knowledge systems. And we need to have a common voice as a global South in managing and documenting and inventorying our indigenous knowledge systems. And most importantly, this is the one least recognized. We need to have an interest in the branding space, particularly geographical indications and communal branding of products. This is so important. I put them at the center stage of global trade. So we also have to be looking at the broader STI policy, that is science technology policy. We're talking about open science recently. People are taking genomic sequences of local products and plants and putting them into global databases in laboratories outside of Global South. And who exploits this knowledge? And therefore, we need to begin to think about legislative intervention. What I have found through my work is that Africa and the Global South make a big deal of indigenous knowledge systems at international level. But when you come to real legislative space at local level, it is missing. I'll give you an example. The AU's Science and Technology Strategy for Africa, elaborated up to 2014, is silent about indigenous knowledge systems. Okay, drill it down a little bit home to South Africa. South Africa has an elaborate indigenous knowledge systems act and policy and law. But South Africa recently developed a policy for the fourth industrial revolution. Guess what? That policy made no connection between the so-called fourth industrial revolution and indigenous knowledge systems. And there are pockets of laws in, in, in Africa, including Kenya that has a traditional knowledge law and so on and so forth. There is a failure to make that connection. So, and, and I can also tell you that in 2000, Africa developed the African modern law, model law for the protection of the rights of local communities and farmers and breeders, and for the regulation of access to biological resources. And this law was ahead of its time, even ahead of India in the recognition of farmers' rights as a strategic self-sustaining model of food security for Africa. But up to today, most laws on plant breeding in Africa do not seem to take farmers' rights to save farm saved seeds and to exchange it seriously. And we know that farmers are the very foundation of our food security on that continent. So owing to external pressures, African countries have gone ahead to implement plant variety protection laws with little consideration of a farmers' fundamental rights to freely exchange farm saved seeds. Rather, we're bringing laws from abroad that make us look like all we do is plant breeding in the conventional sense. That is not what we do. Our own genetic modification, if you like, is different, is traditionally based. And we don't have laws that actually incentivize this factor endowment that we have. So with stronger South-South partnership, there is enough economic and political muscle we can use 
to put indigenous knowledge systems as a strategic launch pad for inclusive democratic participation in wealth creation. And it's so important because indigenous knowledge is the only knowledge framework that will really democratize knowledge production and apprenticeship and sensitive to gender and everything we talk about in the sustainable development goals. It is possible to entrench progressive patent examination processes and documentation and classifications of GK. India has done this to make sure that traditional knowledge-based innovations are not frittered away through biopiracy and the intellectual property system. Now we can build a more inclusive geographical indication systems that account for regional products of distinct quality and the self-policing international branding integrity that shames appropriation of TK-based products. And there are win-win opportunities to change from a rent-based and raw material mindset to TK-based entrepreneurship across complex value chain, particularly in the organic and niche products that speak to food, agriculture, produce, nutrition, and cosmetics. And I want to conclude by saying, all this would be quite possible through a South-South partnership because African regional bloc cannot do it alone. If you reach out to India, to Brazil, and to even Indonesia, to the global South, which is really the reservoir of global genetic resources, and traditional or indigenous knowledge, we are capable of shifting the dial from the status quo and bringing indigenous knowledge into real wealth creation. If you look at sustainable development goals number one to 17, there is no item there that could not be empowered through recognition of indigenous knowledge, not only by advocacy, but through serious policy and legislative interventions. Thank you very much. I hope we should be able to unravel some of this uh, through the discussions. Thank yes. you. Thank you so much, Professor Graham, and thank you so immensely. In fact, highlighting the fact that we need a common voice, and that is why this sort of event is very, very important in terms of speaking to South-South approaches to cooperation. And I absolutely agree that you know Africa makes a big debate when you go to international platforms and discusses. Africa keeps reminding um, the international bodies and you know tables that it is important we do domesticate and think about African realities, but then you come back to Africa, you find that this is not even reflected and charity must begin at home. If you look at the digital transformation strategy for Africa 2020 to 2013, you also find that there is no conceptual clarity in terms of if we intend to apply, you know, African indigenous knowledge systems or even capacities in discussions. I, I absolutely was blown away with your perspectives. And of course, we'll come back to you as well. I would go to Kobotsu now, and one of the issues you find in relation to discourses related to the role of technology in public life is that you find what I may call a restrictive notion or restrictive notions and interpretations to the role of technology in public life. Sometimes this discussion that technology is all about development. It would be great if you can share your perspectives. And um, Professor Chidi talked about the SDGs as well. It would be great if you can share your perspective, Kobotso, on the alternative frameworks on the role of technology in public life. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in this event. I'm so excited because I think um, Prof and Nekesa laid the foundation for me. <laughs> I was even feeling like they will think I typed my presentation as they were <laughs> presenting, as they were presenting. But this is an indication that we are all concerned as Africans and we are beginning to speak in the same language. So I've got a presentation because my work is very visual. I need to take you into my space, which is my community, so that you can be able to visualize the alternative framework that I'm suggesting. So I'm going to share 
my screen. So without going into the cover of my presentation, this cover here captures the complexity of the digital transformation. It captures the Eurocentric and the exclusions of the indigenous um, knowledge systems as Prof was saying. So I don't aim to go into it, but I just wanted to say indeed, um, we do have a challenge with the current methodologies or approaches. So in my research, I was trying to move beyond the technology determinism, which says that if you put a computer center or a computer lab, there will be some sort of transformation that happens. And I'm saying that it should not be deterministic. It should be about understanding public life, understanding people you know, as complete human beings and locating technology in that space. But the way we locate it, it must be aligned to people's way of doing and being instead of coming up with solutions from outside and asking the, uh, the community to engage with those solutions. So in my research, I'm applying Mandwani, which is an African philosophy or what I call an African pedagogy of learning and skills transfer. This was used by Africans before the introduction of the Western education. Um, if you check, it was very common in the Southern Africa. I'm not sure about other parts of the world. But in Mandwani, what drives Mandwani is that we learn by doing. And we understand that failing is part of continuous improvement. But most of it, most importantly, we learn from others by role modeling and you know, peer learning, and we work with what we have. Co-creation and systems thinking are the most critical part of the Mandwani environment. So I'm using this because I look back and said, Africans are not incapable people. Africans had ways of dealing with their children, training them to become powerful members of the society. So in this day and era, what is so difficult about technology, which drives the narrative that Africa is not innovative, when Africa is shown that it is innovative and most of the innovation could be traced back to Africa. So I try to draw lessons from this um, Mandwani and um, ways of doing and learning. But I'm not the first person to work with Mandwani. I'm drawing on lessons from Tebo Kumbani who applied this methodology in the agriculture sector where she was working with communities on food security. And I found that it was a very powerful approach which dealt with the inferiority complex of the communities that she was working with and helped them to free them from the poverty of the mind. Because she was saying that as South Africans, we've been through a lot. Colonization, apartheid, we have lost confidence to a point that we don't believe in ourselves. So for us to engage in any form of development, we must first deal with the mind. So I'm using or drawing lessons from Tsebo Kumbani. But in my study to understand what was happening, I started by discovering what are these cultural ways of knowing and being within the context of my village. So I wanted to understand how the households, you know, view their culture and how they view themselves in that cultural space. I also wanted to measure their cultural awareness and the level of practice. Once I understood that, I asked them how they feel about you know, the laws of culture. You can see that in the graph, there's a high awareness of culture, but the practice is dropping. So we had a conversation about that and discussed about how technology could benefit them or help them to improve the various systems. So if you look at the graph, you will see that it is all about the health, I mean, all the systems, farming, economic, financial, communication, health, everything that makes up a community. So I found that if I draw from the cultural practices, I am able to locate digital transformation within a cultural approach. So I looked at 
a framework by Maggie Hannah, which I adapted. And in my adaptation, I was saying that our cultural knowledge systems should be the glue that holds everything together. So in that system, you do need digital skills, you need localization, you need appropriate technology, but you also need leadership that is committed to a people-centered approach. So what I can see from my study, which is currently going on, I can see that there is potentiality of this African or of culturally embedded framework in facilitating the inclusive and active participation of rural communities in the digital knowledge economy. I'm aware that my time is short, so maybe I shouldn't go into this um, next slides. But what I was emphasizing is that in the community where I come from, the digital transformation is rooted in the collectivism and the social capital that exists in that space. I also found that by understanding the cultural practices and the knowledge systems, I was able to drive the conversations based on what people know, engage with, you know, on a daily basis. I also found that people are not empty vessels. People know and do engage with the digital transformation, but they're not engaging with it from the perspective of policymakers or the people that are driving this uh, ICT4D. So I discovered that as much as we want to engage with communities, our starting point should also focus on mind mobilization, capacity building that is not aimed at convincing people to adopt digital technologies, but something that will say to an individual, I am capable. I can see that my community is capable, my continent is capable, and collectively we are capable of leading our digital transformation agenda, which talks to what uh, Prof was talking about, that um, we need to consolidate, you know, as a, as a continent. So I would like to stop here. Uh, I can come back to show you exactly what is happening in my village. Thank you so much, Karot. So thank you. And um, I agree totally. I I keep saying that, you know, the capacity building needs in the global south would not necessarily be the capacity building needs in the global north. And what I take from your intervention is that we need to reconceptualize capacity building agenda in the global south. And, you know, thank you for highlighting the importance of understanding people in the technology space in Africa and having a community-based approach to technology governance. And of course, that is important to understanding Africa and innovation in Africa. You also touched upon the fact that there is indeed a potential for including African um, communal dimensions in tech governance, understanding cultural practices, social perspectives, and even exploring our historical realities. I was thrilled when you said, you know, innovation, you know, it also comes from Africa. And this touch upon, um, it touched upon what Professor Chidi was saying in terms of saying that technology is being used to exploit indigenous um, knowledge in Africa and at the same time, you know, exporting it and leaving that space. I would then come to Gunja. Um, I've been waiting um, to hear um, Gunja speak as well. Gunja, um, I'm going to ask you to speak about the role of South-South cooperation. And of course, um, Professor Chidi also talked in detail about the value of having a common voice, the value of exploring cooperation and its importance to you know, expanding and pursuing the discussion we're having this morning. Can I ask you, Gunjan, to talk to us about you know, the role of South-South cooperation and how important is this for advancing technology governance and the knowledge economy in the global South? Thank you. Certainly, Nana. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, lovely introduction and a very uh, thoughtful question that you put to me. Um, it's, it's a true privilege to be here in front of uh, such distinguished uh, uh, individuals who just spoke before me as my co-panelists. And I was listening and taking copious notes as uh, uh, some very fascinating points have come from this discussion that I'd like to touch upon. I almost lost track of uh, what I had thought of uh, speaking of, and I was wishing that we had a little bit more time for Kopozo to finish her uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, so if I do have time left in the end, I would yield, her, yield the floor back to her uh, just uh, uh, 
uh, as a, a, a just out of curiosity more than anything else. Um, so uh, as, as you uh, mentioned in my introduction, Nena, I work primarily on cybersecurity and cyber conflict uh, issues. And that's, uh, that's the angle from which I'm coming uh, at these issues. So I want to begin with a provocation and a somewhat pessimistic note, and hopefully I will uh, end with a more positive, uh, on a more positive connotation. Um, uh, first, uh, certainly, I, I think the speakers before me have done an exceptionally good job of outlining the need for South-South cooperation in this field and strengthening partnerships and collaborations. Uh, but I want, to be, I want to take a step back from this position and ask why the need for a South-South cooperation in the first place, where we live in the reality, we, we live in a reality where the digital divide is a very real phenomenon. Uh, we live in a world where a teenager or a hacker wearing pajamas in their living room in the United States has more uh, cyber firepower, so to speak, than entire, uh, than entire militaries of countries. Uh, so this very stark digital divide uh, is, of course, uh, one of the main challenges that we are grappling with. Sure, surely that is one of the goals to narrow the digital divide. But in the face of this digital divide, what, what international legal frameworks come to our aid? And of course, the first place we look at is international human rights law. Uh, interestingly, uh, the talent manual, which is supposed to be, uh, which is supposedly the Bible of uh, how international law applies to cyberspace, uh, when we come to looking at what its stance is on international human rights law and how it applies to technology, it explicitly states that technology is not a right in itself. And that's a very depressing proposition to read, right? Uh, it says technology is not a right in itself, but merely an enabler of rights. So from the very get-go, we're beginning from a position of disadvantage where uh, the Global South cannot ask as a matter of right to be given access to certain technologies and knowledge systems. Um, and so uh, we, we start to look at other partners where the digital divide is relatively narrower uh, where the conflict of values might be less acrimonious as it would be in certain other cases where uh, supplanting certain technologies into our, uh, into our own domestic systems might lead to a certain form of hollow development where the foundational legal social structures that exist are not mature enough to handle the kind of technologies that are coming in from the West or the global North, however you may choose to phrase it. Um, now, uh, the other aspect uh, that I want to talk about other than, and of course, we all know that international human rights law does not regulate horizontal relationships between states. So there's no obligation that state A owes to state B arising out of international human rights law. International human rights law regulates vertical relationships between how individual governments interact with and treat their own citizens. So where does that leave us with access, uh, with questions surrounding access to technology? And, um, uh, and the governance structures that surround it. Now, coming to the second part of the theme for today, technology governance, I want to draw a distinction, and this is something that we had a chance to speak about when we last met, Nana, as well, is to draw a distinction between the governance of technology and governance through technology. Now, governance of technology is certainly something that the Global South struggles with across the board, where legal, uh, legal and social structures are struggling to keep up with the uh, breakneck speed at which technology is developing today. So the law is always playing catch up with technology. But the new kind of uh, uh, governance issue that we need to worry about, I would say, is governance through technology and how uh, e-governance and uh, associated systems are increasingly being treated as important uh, infrastructural requirements uh, to conduct the governance of a country satisfactorily. Um, and th this becomes an important question when we're talking uh, under the rubric of technology governance, right? Now, which one are we talking about? Are we talking about governance of technology or governance through technology? Uh, and this relates directly to how the knowledge economy would uh, develop itself in any given particular, in any given context. While governance of technology uh, would require certain prerequisite knowledge of how these technological systems function, governance through technology could again lead us back into the paradigm of hollow development where we are supplanting certain technological systems in a social context where they don't necessarily fit. 
and uh, i think most most of my co panelists would agree that technology transfers are not value neutral in fact nikesha touched upon the need for shared values when we are talking about shared technologies as well um that the what are the embedded values that we are importing when we also import technologies whether from the global north or from other global south countries is something that recipient nations need to think about very very carefully and it's heartening to see that uh, uh, my co panelists are uh, laying that as much emphasis as they are on the need to develop indigenous capacity and indigenous uh, knowledge systems in this regard because an understanding of the self is what is going to support a robust system of gov of whether governance of technology or governance through technology i think uh, 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 to uh, to blindly supplant uh, uh, any and every piece of technology that we come across um is only going to lead to more problems than create uh, solutions that uh, help us solve our everyday problems now uh, uh, india certainly has laid great emphasis on south south cooperation historically although uh, up until the 1990s india itself was uh, one of the biggest recipients of foreign de foreign development aid but that has changed uh, in recent times however the itech which is the international technology and economic cooperation program with other countries dates back to the 1960s where uh, india and south africa have uh, engaged in technological uh, capacity building and knowledge sharing since the six, as far as uh, as far back as the 60s more recently uh, what was established in 2009 as the pan african e network project which has been commissioned in 47 countries is equipped to support e governance telemedicine tele education and the like uh, so we do see uh, uh, moves especially from india in uh, expanding its reach to our peers in the global south and uh, uh, assisting with the with investments in material technologies however what i would like to also focus on and nana you touched upon this uh, uh, earlier is the need to redefine Uh, to reconceptualize the capacity building agenda in the global south where uh, we need to shift focus not just from investments in material technologies but uh, look at what exactly are the knowledge skills and uh, assets that we need to have as far as our human resources are concerned uh, it is those it is after all uh, the human element in these technological social in these socio technical structures that are going to drive change whether positive or negative and the kind of leapfrogging that we see in certain jurisdictions i can't uh, speak for others but certainly in india uh, we can see uh, that we are still grappling with the kind of security challenges that 5g has given uh, has engendered however without having fully grappled with those we are already talking about developing 6g technologies and how to stay ahead of the curve in that respect so this uh, uh, technological i don't want to say arms race but it's certainly some sort of a race in technological development that we seem to all be a part of and want to be want to end up at at the front of the line but we are kind of losing the forest for the uh, we're losing the forest for the trees in this uh, in this kind of an approach so when we are talking about south south cooperation i think what we should focus on is where uh, is how the narrow digital divide also translates into a narrower difference between what values come embedded with this technology um uh, one example of course is uh, the uh, instance of the covin uh, app which is the uh, portal that the indian government has developed to facilitate uh, appointments for vaccination and i'm not and i i know i'm jumping and i'm jumping jumping the gun not talking about india's role uh, in uh, supplying vaccines to uh, at least 90 other nations but talking instead about the technology portal that facilitates the process of vaccinating the populations which uh, certain other countries are also keen to adopt uh, so before this adoption i think coming from uh, the context where this system was developed i think uh, i uh, i would certainly caution those who are looking to adopt these technologies to look at what are the pros and cons what are the potential pitfalls of embedding these technologies what are the embedded values that are coming in with this technology into your jurisdiction is definitely something to deliberate upon and not rush into um and i'm conscious of the time so i will uh, stop there
Thank you so much, Gunjan. Thank you, as as always. And of course, um, you know, reiterating the value of understanding the digital divide and in relation to our realities in the global south. And of course, thinking about the relevance of cooperation. One thing you highlighted, which is exceptional is that we must think about the distinction of governance of technology and governance through technology and we see that you know there is an inclination in the global south towards you know governance through technologies and that has laid out so many interpretations including how governments stifle digital rights understanding of what tech governance means understanding of you know how people should assess technology and this even impacts our understanding of how people should have access to technology and you hear this when states in the global south begin to remind us that they do not necessarily owe any obligations and so they can you know embed these technologies because human rights allows a progressive reality of social and economic rights. So thank you so much. Um, this is um, to remind the audience that this is the time for question and answer. Um, already we are having questions and to ask that, you know, feel free to use the raise your hand function. I'm happy to give you the floor to ask your question directly. And you can also put your questions in the Q&A box and we can ask away. Um, Nakesa, before I take questions from the floor, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I particularly enjoy Enjoyed your take um, on, you know, grassroots priorities for grassroots um, development of innovation when you said we must think about curating collaboration and you spoke emphatically about inclusion of experts. I wanted to ask, you see, internationally, regionally, and even nationally, um, if you like, in several discourses, a multi-stakeholder approach to digital cooperation has been emphasized. And you talked about what Afri Lab is doing and how you include experts. How do we, on a larger scale in the Global South, how can we prioritize a multi-stakeholder approach um, um, to what we are discussing? And of course, how do we include experts from diverse sectors? How can that, public-private partnership challenge you find in Africa be addressed? Um, so two things. I, I think for me, what, what I have experienced, and, and, and I say this coming from the background of we've had um, national governments setting up hubs or labs across different countries, uh, or we've had um, development agencies coming into Africa to set up hubs. And it hasn't, for majority of the time, it just doesn't work out, or it takes a bit of time before they're able to, to, to actually show some kind of impact for their work. And when you drill down to the actual issues, it is that they, they never engage the existing ecosystem. Um, I mean, the ecosystem has existed for, for a while, for several decades. And so there's people that have been working, innovating, building products, scaling products across the continent. So, there is stuff, there's stuff we know, right? Um, and, and so for me, that, that has been the, the one point where we've kind of um, lost, lost track, where we haven't engaged, especially where you have the resources. So governments for sure have the resources, development agencies have the resources, and for sure they should be coming um, into the ecosystem and, and doing their part, but, but also pay attention to, to what's happening and who's doing what. and and get into the matrix so to speak and and begin to work with them so so that's one um but the other is uh we need to understand our why first as africans as you know ecosystems we need to know why we're doing what we're doing and 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 this is what i meant when i spoke about what is that vision and do you share it with other people and once you hold that vision dear then you begin to understand who you need to begin to work with to, to make that vision a, rea a, rea a reality. So at, at Africans, for example, yes, we do prioritize connecting our hubs to each other, but we also work with multiple stakeholders. And a great example is work that we're doing with um, Mozilla and Media Network, actually, um, that's focused on reimagining what innovation means in the African context. And so these are organizations with a footprint across the globe. Um, but because as AfriLabs, as an African ecosystem, we understand that we want to create, recreate for ourselves what innovation means in our context, then we're able to invite great partners and say let's work together on you know on on this initiative and another quick example i can give is work that we're doing with liquid technologies where again we understand that our priority is to ensure that our hubs have easy access to internet connectivity 
And so it then makes sense to approach liquid technologies and say, hey, let's work on a joint project that ensures that our hubs, regardless where they are on the continent, have as a basic, um, quite, I mean, ha have at the very basic uh, access to some kind of connectivity that allows anyone that walks into the space be able to access the internet and, and innovate. So definitely always open to collaborations, but it must start from what is dear to us and, and also having a shared vision with people and then inviting them um, to work with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikesa. And I was actually, there's a question for Professor Chidi, and I was actually going to ask him, you know, to speak about the dynamics of law making, how we can change that. And there is a question for you that says, could the starting point to translating discussions at the global level to how Africa chooses to or not to legislate and manage knowledge production locally be to recognize our knowledge as knowledge? Why should it carry the tag of traditional and I think he meant indigenous? Um, that is a very good question. And it's really important that we look at it carefully. Um, we have contested the whole reference to traditional or indigenous in that space. But um, the reality is that if you don't self-define, somebody defines you and you begin to do a catch up game. But in the whole epistemology of, you know, what is science, what is not science, it is clear, very clear, that when we talk about indigenous knowledge systems, it's actually a recognition to the power dynamics that one has claimed to be scientific before the other. But if you look at it carefully, the fact that something is called traditional does not make it less innovative. And therefore the literature is very robust on this. Let's talk about even Western science, for example, and its own process of uh, wealth creation and how it empowers only the powerful and how it is so narrow in determining what a phenomenon is and so on and so forth. And then you have an alternative, let's call it a, an alternative knowledge system. Uh, and, and I keep saying that the, the, the greed and of the global north and, and, and the scientific industrial complex has driven us into the ditch of climate crisis. It has not worked. It has not distributed wealth fairly. And therefore, when we talk about alternative knowledge system, however described, we're thinking about another worldview about how to engage our environment with a view to a sustainable, respectful, and a, 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 an environment that shares wealth, that respects gender, and everything you can even think about, about a sustainable future. So let us be clear. The system that has dominated us for so long has not worked. And that is why the world is undergoing existential crisis, however you look at it. And therefore, I don't want to believe that we are carrying a baggage or a tag of traditional. If anything, there is beauty in tradition and tradition is innovative. And it's a matter of how we could be able to give power to this framework. But the whole thing boils down to power. If you go to the World Intellectual Property Organization, if you go to the United Nations General Assembly, who has the veto power? Who finances WIPO to a degree that they wield influence in determining how policies are made? That is why this platform is so powerful and important, the way it has been framed to talk about South-South cooperation. Africa has about 54 countries. If you go there, at the end of the day, how many of them get there with the right experts to really talk? It's not that we don't have the experts, but what is our governance system to take the best of us to meet the best of the rest? And if, if you look at the rest of the global South, what India has done with traditional knowledge digital library, and how that has changed the patent system to a significant degree. So there is no baggage or shame in tradition. It's a matter of how you project it and the kind of power you have to present it at a global stage as an alternative to uh, the sustainability that we are all craving for. And let's be clear, they take a lot of that knowledge that we have and use it in the test tube system, reinvent it and bring it back to us. Some of us drinking pills, with ginger and, and God knows 
I go to the market here, I see people, you know, selling stuff that I know way back in Nigeria that nobody even cares about. But now it's being repackaged and sent back. This is what we have to resist. There is a wealth of knowledge in the traditional knowledge system, or if you like, call it indigenous knowledge system. However described, I want us to believe in ourselves and then reach out with the, the kind of power that we need to present our case at a global stage. And that's why South-South cooperation is so important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Chidi. Thank you for answering that question. I would give the floor to Tangai Mariga. Um, Tangai, please um, introduce yourself and then feel free to ask your question briefly, please. Yes. Uh, am, I, uh, uh, am I audible at all? Absolutely. Loud and clear. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this is uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Ifeanyi Ajufo, correct? Absolutely. And uh, all the rest of the members of the panel or uh, participants on this platform. Um, I am actually a Zimbabwean and a health professional, healthcare professional. And uh, obviously uh, just going through the pandemic, which you are almost actually overcoming, uh, but not as yet. I uh, have uh, just uh, learned a very, very important point for reflection which is the essence and the importance of uh, technology to our health, well-being and existence. However short it is actually proving, uh, I was touched by the situation in India, uh, in Africa at large, and also other parts of the world, uh, all actually alluding and pointing to the fact of uh, technology de deficiency. And so I must say it is very, very important to have a platform like this where we talk about South-South cooperation, uh, but also going back to the point just mentioned by uh, um, uh, Gunjani about whether we are talking about cooperating and governing through technology, or we are cooperating for technology or with technology, uh, 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 that remains a critical question. So my question, please, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Ifeanyi Ajudo is, we have been paralyzed or we are seemingly actually putting ourselves in creating further and deeper tiers, uh, 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 which probably um, Professor Uganami is trying to highlight here that we are stifling our own development if we were to take governance through technology or with technology ahead or further ahead of the game by creating structures or extra tiers. Uh, I think we are creating more bureaucracy for our own technological innovations or development uh, 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 by creating additional extra tiers, uh, uh, bureaucratic tiers by way of, I don't know, I don't know, I'm not particularly a favor of this concept of uh, multi-stakeholder engagement uh, because we need to be very cautious on who are the stakeholders do we get involved in, with or in because they are the potential competitors again by not carefully choosing them. So I don't know if there is an endogenous approach to this sort of technology development, learning a very good example, I think from the East African uh, 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 continent, uh, technological development or advancement, as well as also pointing at how actually India has just transformed from, an, from a, a small piece and kind of society to a big technological uh, uh, kind of a leader. I think that was more or less out of an endogenous development system with, I don't know how many stakeholders, I may not be certain to say, but I think their approach to technological development and advancement was very much traditionally based or more or less endogenous based. So are we not seeing ourselves creating a bigger tier or an additional kind of um, barrier to developing our own technology by creating or taking this kind of a multi-stakeholder approach because we don't know who actually becomes interested in our technological innovations. 
this is competition. How do we remain ahead of the game when we already publish what we have innovated before before we have actually <laughs> registered the intellectual property? Of course, um, thank you so much. Thank you um, for those important points. And I would try and draw the question so that I can bring in Kobotsu. And thank you, Tangai. And the fact that, of course, there are so many angles to your contribution, mainly, of course, and, and the question. Um, Kobotsu, I don't know if you would want to touch upon that as to how we can utilize our own indigenous knowledge or you know utilize our communal basis and understanding to advancing our opportunities and i want to bring in um, a question as well from the chat function in terms of are there examples of cooperation on innovation that have worked and basically in relation to you Kobot, so what are the opportunities from african countries to learn from other places like india and the experience in protecting our biological resources, because I noticed your presentation kind of related to um, Professor Chidi's um, question as well. And how can we engage in cooperation on innovation on equal footing? But I, of course, want you to draw back from your, I really wanted you to touch upon what is happening in your community and reflect on these questions as well, the parts which you hadn't highlighted. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll start with the, communal stuff, how we can use our communal processes to drive innovation. I think we cannot be isolated as Africans. I know that there's always a narrative that, you know, communities are so behind, we must first go and teach them what is a smartphone because they don't know how to use such devices. But with my experience, I've realized that actually policymakers and practitioners who sit in boardrooms are behind because they think communities are waiting for them, you know, to drive innovation. Whereas communities are already doing something. The only thing that they don't have is the infrastructure and maybe the superior knowledge of developing a software that could form part of the global system of innovations. But I believe that if we give ourselves time or if we don't have time as practitioners and policymakers, we need to release the power that we are heading back into the hands of the community so that we give them the opportunity to explore. And when they explore, they won't be exploring, you know, how to engage with Facebook, but they will be exploring how do I turn my marula tree into a product that can help me to generate income, create opportunities, but being supported by the existing technologies or even new technology that can emerge. So in my case, I think there's a great opportunity for Africans to learn from one another. In our village, we have recently deployed a network, a community network infrastructure. We are connecting six villages with internet. And this is not like low cost, it's low cost because it's affordable, but it's quality internet. So we were able to learn from a movement of community networks, which brings African countries, you know, together to discuss about how to connect the unconnected. So I think as Africans, we are at the same space where we understand that we need each other. We've got the collective power to change our narrative, but the systems in the global space are suffocating us <laughs> because we have seen examples of uh, innovation that comes from Africa. And then you don't have the money to expand. Somebody comes and buys you out, then you have lost it. So I think our main problem is capital and infrastructure. Thanks. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Kobotsu. And um, Mira, who asked the question I posed to you, also asked another question. But before that, I would like, um, Mukilan, would you like to take the floor to ask your question? I'm, I'm happy to give you the floor. You can be unmuted and you can ask your question. Um, although I wanted to pose the question to Gunjan because um, she talked about, you know, the dynamics of the digital divide, and I wanted to relate it back to 
Tangai's question. So please, you have the floor. Oh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Absolutely. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, so amazing talk by everyone. And it was very informative uh, discussion. So I was wanted to ask uh, Professor uh, Chidi and also uh, to Gunjan. Uh, it's kind of like a mixed bag. Um, so I was wondering how to decolonize the technology that has already been uh, taken out of from the global south, say it from Africa, India, or any other country, and has been rebranded into capitalism. And now it has been sold back uh, to the global south itself, and people cannot access this right now. So what would be the main idea, as a uh, professor was saying before, to decolonize this aspect? And how would you govern it in the longer term? That would be uh, my question. Uh, as far as I understand that uh, uh, governing it uh, through technology is more of a uh, luxury in terms of uh, countries from the global south, even though we are uh, uh, building a robust infrastructure, it, it, it is not as robust or um, it is not um, necessary in some aspects, but rather in my personal opinion, I see that uh, governing of technology is more uh, required as uh, technology from Western societies are more pervasive and uh, they do um, affect global south in different means. So I wanted to ask uh, which is more of a necessity and how uh, the governance should work in a longer term, especially with indigenous knowledge. That would be my question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Professor Chidi, would you want to touch upon that in one or two minutes because we're behind time and then I'll give the floor to Gunjan who will take the question. And also I want her to address Tangai's point about a multi-stakeholder um, approach as well. So you have the floor, Professor Chidi. Thank you, Dr. Nena. Um, and thank you, uh, Mukilan. That's a very, very important question. What I would say is this. Um, when the horse has bolted out of the stable door, um, the damage is already done, but there could be middle grounds to begin to seek compensation. Um, in the cultural artifacts part of the knowledge production, we've been talking about reparation and stuff like that, and how far that goes is a different thing. But I'm more interested in the future and the present. Um, for example, uh, most of us here know that um, if you have a medicinal plant, let's say that is endemic to a particular region of the global south, and uh, people would naturally come there and kick the plant and put it in their briefcase and fly away and do stuff. But that is no longer the case today. All you need to do is to do genomic sequencing of that plant, and then you'll be able to upload the information in a global database. Every other person can come and pick it up and use it to do their research and get patent and stuff like that. So we have come to a stage in knowledge production where our physical access and physical ownership to these resources and even the associated traditional knowledge is no longer guaranteed to be our negotiating advantage. So what do we do? All we need to do is to begin to think about a global basket instead of people telling us that data is so important, you can own data. Yeah, if you own data, to what end? If you cannot use it, if you cannot put it in your lab, if you cannot use it to create knowledge, what we could be thinking about is how the, the, the wealth created by that data can be shared and equitably distributed so that all of us who have contributed in one way or the other will benefit from it instead of allowing them to take it away from us, lock it up and use it to create knowledge and sell it back to us. So we are looking at a stage of global um, investment in knowledge and in ownership of joint ownership and equitable distribution, rather than all these moribund and uh, inconsequential frameworks that they tend to begin with. For instance, we are making laws about data protection, like, I mean, one of you told me, it's almost like co copy and paste. By the time you do that, what value does it add to the local economy? How does it empower us? And how does it even make us to be up to speed? with the way knowledge is being transformed through the use of technology. So I'll stop at that and be able to let uh, the other person take the rest of the question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Chidi. Gunjan, back to you. Uh, thank you, Nana. I'll, I'll address the decolonization of technology question first and then come to the multi-stakeholder one. 
Um, I think that's a very loaded question, how to decolonize technology that's taken from us, uh, rebranded and then sold back. Um, uh, typically, in, a, in, in response to this, I would say to decolonize technology, we need to begin with decolonizing our own minds about what we think about these indigenous uh, knowledge systems and indigenous technologies. I think um, uh, Professor Chidi alluded to India uh, as an example in several instances. Um, and another instance that I would like to add is that of Ayurveda, or traditional uh, healing systems and medicine that we have had uh, uh, for centuries uh, in the country, which has now been, in a sense, reclaimed uh, to a certain extent and is being popularized uh, with uh, unprecedented enthusiasm by the current uh, administration. In fact, um, uh, just a few days ago, I remember reading that uh, the daughter of the Kenyan prime minister was uh, received uh, some treatment in an Ayurvedic hospital in India, and now there is going to be an Ayurvedic hospital uh, that Kenya is seeking to set up in uh, their jurisdiction. So uh, I think the starting point certainly uh, needs to be uh, before the harm is done. I fully agree with Professor Chidi that, uh, you know, there's no uh, locking the door. There's no point locking the door once the horse has bolted out of the barn. Um, so I think we need to take certain preventative uh, measures uh, if, if we're still talking in the decolonization paradigm because a decolonization of spaces has to begin with a decolonization of our own minds. And I must admit that I have my own reservations about the effectiveness of Ayurveda. So I think I, I myself have a lot of homework to do as far as decolonization of our minds goes. Uh, so I'll end on that uh, somewhat um, uh, uh, on a lighter note in response to this question. Uh, but uh, as far as the question on multi-stakeholder engagement goes and whether that is holding back our development, I think that's a very, uh, very thoughtful question that uh, Mukilan has put before us. Um, and uh, I must admit that my own thoughts on multi-stakeholder engagement currently are in an, uh, uh, in, in a, undergoing a process of evolution and how I think about this. Because uh, certainly there is a value to having civil society, uh, non-governmental organizations being represented in decision-making processes. But when we talk about non-government stakeholders, that of course includes multinational corporations as well. And, that, and the introduction of that particular non-state actor uh, completely changes the dynamic of what multi-stakeholder engagement looks like, um, uh, especially considering the... Uh, uh, relative bargaining power that governments may or may not have in relation to uh, big tech, for instance, uh, is uh, certainly uh, one case where we need to we need to think about multi-stakeholder engagement with a certain degree of cautious optimism and not jump headfirst into this. However, um, uh, I will also add that there is a there's certainly value to uh, value to promoting multi-stakeholder engagement as far as participatory uh, democratic processes are concerned. So uh, how we interpret multi-stakeholder engagement would, uh, to cut my response short, uh, would then depend on who these multi-stakeholder, who constitutes the multi-stakeholder community uh, and uh, to what extent is this open? Because uh, I, I recognize the risks that Mukilan is pointing towards, uh, but, uh, I would say that these are not risks that cannot be mitigated. Uh, so a cautious approach is uh, what I would counsel in response to this question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gunjan. Um, I, I, you know, um, someone who is very passionate about multi-stakeholder approach, I know I've heard you touch upon this before, and that was why, and interesting perspective, you know, Tangai brought into this, and it, it's good to hear you elaborate on it as well. I have one more question because of time, just the last question, and I want to ask this question, maybe because I'm an academic, I'm a bit biased about research, and I really want to ask, and it was a question from Mira. Initially, I wanted to ask her to take the floor, but because of time, and the question is related to Nekesa. And I, you know, I could ask anyone the question. 
And oh, I think Nekisa has already taken the question. It was about um, research and I see you've already answered the question. I would then go ahead and wrap up. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, this ends a series of events, roundtables related to South-South cooperation in terms of digital governance. And the Chatham House African program, Africa program has been driving these conversations since last year. And we've had various roundtables. And what you had today drew from the value of those conversations in relation to how you can find a South South based approach to ensuring cooperation on technology governance in the global South. It has touched upon so many issues South South cooperation, digital labor, encryption, and so many other issues related to technology governance. And that was why I said um, Gunjan's point about, you know, Gunjan's point about governing through technologies and governance of technology must be understood. We have had so many points highlighted over the past few weeks the importance of legislation. We have had discussions about the importance of capacity building, the importance of priority, uh, prioritizing policies and what should be in policies. And today, a very good um, discourse that came up was decolonization. And this had touched upon some of the efforts, you know, um, that you found reflected in the conversations we've been having about the fact that there's been an imposition, not necessarily imposition, but then a transplanting of Northern epistemologies. You find that in some aspects aspects of copy and paste of legislations when you look at how technology is governed. Another issue that has been highlighted overly has been digital rights and the approach of you know, governments, particularly in Africa, to drive understandings of govern governing technology and how rights are being stifled, how rights are being taken away in the guise of national security, in the um, guise of technology governance and cybersecurity. So it has been a very important um, project and I'm so happy to have been part of this. And I want to say thank you to our speakers. Thank you so much for joining us today. Exceptional conversations. And I want to say to the audience that the conversation can continue. Feel free to send emails to the Chatham House Africa program to continue this conversation. It would be good to also get your perspectives of what you think are the priorities and what is important. So thank you so much, Nekesa. Thank you for your absolutely exceptional perspectives. Thank you to Kobotso. Thank you so much. I am sure there will be opportunities to hear more about your community-based approach. Thank you so much, Professor Chidi. I am absolutely going to look for the book. Um, I teach IP and innovation, and I heard things I had never heard before. And thank you, as always, Gunjan. Thank you so much. I also want to use this opportunity to mention Dr. Uvashi. Um, Uvashi has been part of this um, project as well, part of the conversations all along, and to thank her also for her immense um, efforts. Um, Uvashi, who has been part uh, of the program, is an associate fellow with the Chatham House Asia Pacific Program and the founding director of Digital Futures Lab. And she's also, um, she has also been a researcher as well in Oxford, um, a lecturer at the University of Oxford and an associate professor of international relations at the OP Jindal Global University. So thanks to everyone and thanks to the Africa um, program, Chatham House, thanks to the Chatham House Africa program for this um, exceptional afternoon. We hope to see you as we further conversations on this. Have a lovely afternoon, everyone, and see you very soon. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs>